All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Joe Elliott. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, where are the ladies? Good morning. Good to be with you. And we've got some folks per usual that are joining us in a different time and place. Um, so shout out to the folks that are joining by video and coming. Uh, the UK, the Philippines, et al. Um, fresh bread. Um, you know, Ron just asked to share with kind of where I happened to be in the word at the time. And, um, you know, when I think of fresh, you, you might get a little, it's probably going to be a little doughy. Okay. And I got a little, I got a little flour on my, my face and all that kind of stuff, but, uh, you can roll with it. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, in this room, as I look around, there's probably, you know, when you think of your the decade of your birth, we probably got safe estimates, safe swag, seven decades represented in here. That's pretty cool when you think about it. And what that means, one of the things that that means, of course, is that uh, there's a lot of things or events or stories in life that some people in this room have experienced that others have not. Okay? Um, been around the block. A little more life experience, a few more laps around the sun, whatever, right? Um, so I want you to, regardless, I want you to think for a moment in your mind's eye. So if you want to, if you want to close your eyes, you can do that, whatever. But in your mind's eye, I want you to envision where you were and what you were doing on some of the following dates. September 11th, 2000. Got it? Now, some of you may have been in that place at that time. I was not in that place at that time. I've been to the World Trade Center, I've been to New York, but I wasn't in that place at that time. I was in an office over in Duluth, a little startup tech company that uh, I was running at the time. And, you know, when I saw that on the television, it was like, game over. Let's turn the lights out and go do something else. That's pretty, capital markets were already pretty dry anyway. Um, but think about that. Some of you may have been there. You may know someone that was there that didn't make it out. You may know someone that made it out. God willing, they did. Another date. Feel free to play along. If you know it, just shout it out. November 22nd, 1963. JFK's assassination. Now, some of you were alive, some of you weren't. I was alive, but I was little. I don't remember that moment. However, I've actually studied that event. I've reconstituted that event. I've been to Dealey Plaza. I've watched, uh, walked the grassy knoll. I've gone into the armory, like many of you have, okay? And that event, even though I wasn't in that time, I was in that place. And it's affected me. It's had an impact on my life. Fair? Um, April 4th, 1968. MLK's assassination. Lorraine Hotel, Memphis, Tennessee. I've been to Memphis, Tennessee. I have not been to the Lorraine Hotel. I was alive, but I wasn't in that place or in that time. But I remember it. I've looked into it. I've studied it, as many of you uh, have. July 20, 1969. Apollo 11, okay, the debatable uh, moon landing and moonwalk, okay, I wasn't there, I wasn't on in the studio or on the moon, whatever, okay, but I remember watching that on a black and white television, anybody? And for those that haven't, you've probably watched the movie, you've studied the event, there's kind of a... You still experience that moment in a sense, if you will, right? Had an impact on me as a young kid. Um, August 16, 1977. Elvis Presley. Come on, guys, out of all of these, you should know that one. Um, where were you? I wasn't in, I've been to Graceland. I wasn't in Graceland at the time. You know, you 
keeled over on the toilet seat, evidently. I'm glad I wasn't in Graceland at the time, but um, I, was, I was actually in Tennessee at a family farm. I was with my Aunt Hazel. Aunt Hazel loved Elvis, right? So there's other events or stories that we experience either together in a time or place, like we're together today in the same place at the same time. We're experiencing one another. We experience stories or, or that where we weren't in that place or that time, or we've been in that place at another time. And we're just talking about, you know, these collective events, but we've got our own stories or events that we experience, life experience. It could be a victory. It could be a defeat. It could be a trauma in the, your family of origin. You know, um, I remember when my great grandfather died. I remember when I bought my first vehicle. Um, I remember when I met my wife for the first time, had an impact on me, clearly. Um, all of us have these types of stories or events, right? So I found often that, that events or stories can impact us. They can affect us. They can actually set the trajectory for our lives. And this book is full of those. Now, we weren't there, unless you have some special powers that I don't, but we weren't there, but we can go back and experience them, if you will. And, and they do have an impact on our lives. So I'd like to look at one today, very briefly, in 1 Samuel. And in order to get there, um, chapter, chapters 13 and 14 is kind of where I want to settle, but we got to get there, and I'm going to get there as fast as I can get there because I think it's important for the context. And this story, many of you, for, you're familiar with. There's a whole lot here that you can do a deep dive on, but we're going to skip across the surface pretty quickly. So envision uh, podcast at 2x playback speed. Let's just kind of do that and knock this thing out. So um, you've got your table cards. I think a good bit of this is outlined there. Uh, let's go to 1 Samuel. Chapters 1 and 2. Samuel was born. Eli is the uh, happens to be the um, uh, the prophet at the time. He has two sons. They're wicked. Um, Hannah is a, a woman that wants a child. She cuts a deal with God, has a child, dedicates him to the temple. Uh, chapter three. Samuel is recognized. He's older now, obviously, and he's confirmed as a as a prophet of the Lord. Chapter four. Uh, the Philistines defeat Israel. 30,000 Israeli soldiers are wiped out that, in that battle. The Ark of the Covenant was taken captive. Eli dies. He, he, gets, he actually gets news of the, uh, the defeat, and he falls off his seat backwards and breaks his neck. Okay, And his two sons die in the battle. So obviously that sets the stage. Chapter 5 uh, are, are right there uh, by default or by succession, Samuel now becomes the prophet of Israel. Eli's out of the picture, right? Chapter five, the Philistines have taken the Ark of the Covenant and they place it in the house of Dagon, one of their gods. And you guys probably remember this story. The next morning they come in, they put the Ark of the Covenant right next to the statue of Dagon. Next morning, Dagon's on his face. They tilt them back up. Next morning they come in, Dagon's on his face, except now he's decapitated and the palms of his hands are cut off. Okay, so the Philistines kind of spaz and uh, they start playing hot potato with the Ark of the Covenant and they move it from city to city to city and everywhere it goes, the people break out in tumors and many of them die. Okay, it's bad news. God is angry. Um, chapter six, after seven months of this, the Philistines return the Ark to Israel. Now, I think this is interesting uh, here. The, the five lords of the Philistines, basically there's five big cities, there's five lords, and they, they call up the diviners and the priests, the, their pagan diviners and priests, and say, what, what, what should we do? And it's like McFly, you know, the priests and the diviners say, send it back. Just don't return the ark empty-handed. Send a guilt, guilt offering with it. Send five tumors made of gold and five mice made of gold. You ask me, that's kind of weird, but whatever, 
okay? Uh, just saying. But in 6, 5, note, note this, in chapter 6, verse, verse 5, after the priests, after the diviners tell them to send it back, they, they say this in 6, 5. So this is the priest talking, and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will ease his hand from you, your gods in your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? Now, these are pagan priests. So make a note of that. We're going to land on that again in a minute. Make note of that phrase. Perhaps he will ease his hand from you. Send it back. Chapter 7. Uh, there's a, you guys keeping up? Okay. Uh, 2X. Season of peace between uh, the Philistines and Israel. Samuel's a circuit judge at this time. In other words, uh, every year he makes the round city to city, kind of like a circuit preacher, except he's judging. So he sits in court and judges civil and um, uh, criminal matters, if you will. Um, and he also makes sacrifices and all that, all that stuff. Well, he gets old, that gets old. So he appoints his two sons, as judges over Israel, just kind of ease the load, if you will. You follow me? Okay. Um, now think, so his two sons, so think, think Hunter Biden has a twin. Okay. And it says they turned, these two cats turned aside and they, after dishonest gain, they took bribes and they perverted justice. Just imagine what that would be live, like living in a place like that, right? So that, that's the state of affairs. So understandably, the elders of Israel are like, wait a minute, chapter eight, it says the Israelites, the Israel elders therefore confront Samuel about this matter. And they say, dude, give us a king like the rest of the nations. Just give us a king that will judge us and lead us into battle. You guys are familiar with this story, I know. Well, the scripture says that this seemed evil to Samuel. Not just that he was disappointed, it said this seemed evil, that they would request a king. So he goes to talk to God about it. God says to him, the Lord says, listen to them. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. Give them a king, but solemnly warn them and call them and tell them of the process of the king. That will reign over you. Warn them. Give them a cake, but warn them. So Samuel goes and he warns them. Okay, so dashboard, red lights flashing. That's what's going on. And he says to Israel, um, here's the warning. A king is a taker. And he's going to take your sons, your daughters, the best of your land, your first, the, the first of your, the first tenth of your seed, the tenth of your flocks, your male and female servants. And then... You will cry out to the Lord, and he will not answer you. Stern warning. Here's how Israel, the elders of Israel respond in, in chapter 8, verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like the, all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So God says, give him a king, right? Chapter nine, a um, man named Kish, who's a Benjaminite, he has a son named Saul. He, Kish's donkeys are lost. He sends Saul to go look for the donkeys. You know, they didn't have iPhones or a Find My Foal app or anything like that, so... He goes and looks for the donkeys with a male servant. They look to no avail. Eventually, he says, let's go back home. He says to his servant, let's go back home. My dad's going to worry where we're at. And the servant says, the servant says to Samuel, um, let's go. No, the servant says to Saul, a lot of S's here. Um, no, there's, there's a prophet in town. Let's go see him. Maybe he'll tell us, Right. So they go to, and they run, in, run into Samuel. Samuel already had been given a heads up by God. He sees Saul. That's the guy that, you know, you're going to make king. So uh, chapter 10, Samuel privately anoints Saul. And then he also 
prophesies and he tells them in chapter 10, six through nine. And I think this is printed in your book. This is, this is kind of one of the things I want to flesh out here. Then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And he's, so this is Samuel talking to Saul. He's prophesying. He's telling them you're going to be the king. And he doesn't totally get it uh, in the moment. But then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you, Saul, and you will prophesy with them, um, these other prophets, and be changed into another man. It shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires, for God is with you. Do what you think is right. God's with you. And, and, you shall go down before me to Gilgal. Behold, I will come down to you and offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days for me to come. And it says those signs came about on that day. All right, so if we're, if we're Saul, we walk away from our, our conversation with Samuel and all the stuff that he just said, it's going to happen. I run into these prophets. We play the tambourine together. The Spirit of the Lord falls on me and I start prophesying. You start prophesying. It happens, right? So in other words, he's empowered with the Holy Spirit. He's a king. He has authority. God's basically given him a green light. Do do what the occasion requires, right? Um, carte blanche, do what the occasion requires. You'll, you'll know. That's effectively what was in play at that moment. Um, so think of a police officer. Police officer has authority, has a badge, and has a gun. Now, I'm not in law enforcement. I never have been. I've had encounters with law enforcement. But uh, I've, I doubt very seriously if I were a police officer and someone sped by where I was sitting, I probably would not radio in. Hey, somebody just passed me. What should I do? Okay. Well, chase after him and pull him over. Okay, I pull him over. What should I do now? <laughs> okay. He, he has authority, doggone it. He has a badge and a gun, and he does what the occasion requires. He doesn't need to go get permission. Make sense? He's already got it. Okay. So here's a thought. Fresh bread, maybe a little doughy. As I thought about this, I was talking to the Lord about it. Most occasions, said occasions, most occasions are ordinary, everyday situations. Trash cans full. Take out the trash. I don't pray about it. Maybe I should. My grandson hands back to me what I just fed it. Change the diaper. Okay. Um, my old beater has a quarter tank of gas. And it shot up 40 cents a gallon overnight. I go fill it up. <laughs> right? Um, in a sense, most occasions are ordinary, everyday situations. Just do the next right thing. Just do it. Now, in a sense, that's part of what Samuel charged Saul with. Do what the occasion requires. Now, granted, some occasions are extraordinary. They're not every day, right? Nonetheless, do what the occasion requires. So if you're a businessman in Germany who happens to be part of the Nazi party in World War II, and you see the atrocities that are happening in the concentration camps, you go acquire through Aryanization, you acquire a Jewish-owned manufacturing facility. And over the course of time, over a thousand of your Jewish employees, you help escape being deported from, from Auschwitz. This person did what the occasion required, right? You may be in business with your father-in-law, and your father-in-law absconds the funds from you, from the enterprise, and also happens to be cheating on his wife and claims to be a believer. So you bust him, even though you know the house of cards is going to come tumbling down. You do what the occasion requires. Or you're a father who has a son 
who has, and, and many people like him, have significant mental disabilities. So you start a business, and you employ them, and you help them make their way through life with a degree of dignity. You, your mother-in-law is destitute, and you invite her to come live with you and spend the rest of her days. Just do what the occasion requires. Some are ordinary, some are extraordinary. We together? So Samuel calls the people together, publicly makes Saul king, sends him away. So now Saul has an occasion. The Ammonites besiege a city. Saul, Saul's now king. He's plowing the field. He gets news, and he's ticked. And he summons Israel to fight. 330,000 people show up. The next morning, it says, Saul and Israel strike down the Ammonites. He did what the occasion required. Good juicy story. You ought to, ought to look at that in chapter 11. Chapter 12, um, Samuel says, well, let's go renew the kingdom. Okay, let's celebrate. Let's coronate. Okay, you've been privately acknowledged, publicly acknowledged. Now let's coronate the king and renew the kingdom. And essentially what happens there is God renews his covenant with his people. And Samuel says, uh, urges them to fear the Lord and serve him and trust him with all their hearts, considering the great things the Lord has done for them. And he says, but if you do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. Warning, Will Robinson. Chapter 13. So Saul has about, he's, it says he's 30 at the time. Saul's 30. He reigns for 42 years. He reigns till he's 72. So he's, he's 30 years old. He's got 3,000 men, 2,000 with him at, at uh, McMash, and 1,000 with his son, Jonathan, Saul's son, the prince, the heir to the throne, okay, has 1,000. And it says that Jonathan, so think about this. Saul's 30-ish. Saul's, uh, Jonathan's in his teens. Like David, he's in his teens, okay? And it says that Jonathan smote the Philistines and the word got out, the Philistines were ticked. Israel had become odious to the Philistines, right? And so Saul pulls everybody back together, all 3,000 back together and the uh, Philistines assemble to fight. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and, and men like sand by the seashore. Okay, they're ticked. They show up. Consequently, Israel sees this, hide themselves in caves and thickets. You know that story. Some bugged out altogether. Um, and Saul waits seven days. It's part of the prophecy, remember? He waits seven days in Gilgal for Samuel to show up. Samuel no-shows. Saul is getting nervous because by the, by the minute, people are going AWOL. Okay, so his... His 3,000 shrinks down to basically 600 people, okay? And um, Saul took it upon himself to administer the burnt offering. And the scripture says, the minute he did it, Samuel shows up and says, yo, what have you done? Dude, what have you done? And then it's like, uh... Well, uh, you know, it's that moment, right? He disobeyed God. He disobeys a direct order. So it says in 3.13, you've act, Samuel says to 13.13, you've acted foolishly, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought, sought out someone else. It's not yours. By the way, I, I, I wonder, it's conjecture if, Jonathan catches wind of this. Rut row. Divine right of kings. <laughs> the divine king has authority over the divine right of kings. I'm not going to be the king. Maybe. I don't, that's, I'm, I'm speculating. But here's, here's what happens. Here's an occasion. You know, earlier it said, do what the occasion requires. However, he disobeyed a direct order. He disobeyed God. So, an occasion never requires that we disobey. There's the caveat, okay? Um, Samuel leaves, a cold war ensues, the Philistines control the arms race. Here's how, 13, 19 to 23. And then we're, we're gonna land the plane here in a couple minutes and go to the tables for discussion. 
No blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to sharpen their plowshares and axe and mattocks and all that. And they paid two-thirds of a shekel, best I could figure, that's seven to twenty bucks. Okay? Um, so it came about on the day of battle that neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the people. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan. So 600 people, two swords, two spears. Now, you know what the lineup is across, across the way, right? Chariots, horsemen, sand by the seashore. Um, and 14, Jonathan and his young armor bearer secretly peel away. So in 14.1, it says, Now the day came that Jonathan, this teenager, with his young man carrying his armor, a servant, he says, Come, let us, you and me, mano y mano, let us cross over to the Philistines' garrison that's on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So they peel away, these two, with a sword and a spear from the 600. And here's the deal he cuts with his armor bearer. He goes, here's the deal. Uh, 14, 6 through 10. He said to him, hey, come, let's cross over to the other side, to the garrison of the uncircumcised. I love the way that sounds. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, perhaps the Lord will work for us. Remember earlier, the divine, diviners, the pagan priest, perhaps, here it is again. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for he is not restrained to save by many or save by few. On one hand, he's saying numbers don't matter. On one hand, he's saying size doesn't matter. Earlier, it said that Saul counted his men, right? And, and the servant responds, do all that's in your heart. Turn to the side, turn to the right, turn to the left. Here I am. I'm with you, right? Um, and they go. And the Philistines say, uh, come on up here. So they go. Risk is, in the, uh, is always in the direction of our hope. We always risk in the direction of our hope. We live by faith. God wired it that way, right? Jonathan's hope was in God, not so much in the outcome. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but he's God. He did what the occasion required. Best we can tell. It doesn't explicitly say that God said to go do it. Maybe he did, okay? Um, so they revealed themselves. They scaled on their hands and feet. And it says that the, the, the garrison fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer. Now, a little side story here. A man named B.A. Foster. B.A. Foster was born, and I'm going to bring it right back, was born in 1888 in Limestone, Tennessee. Now, Limestone is just a little bit outside of Jonesboro. Jonesboro is supposedly the oldest town in Tennessee. So B.A. moves, uh, and, and the, the Foster family lore says that he's, he's somehow related to Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett's from them parts, okay? So B.A. has a piece of land on what is now 11E, and he works his land. Now, B.A. was my great-granddaddy. I called him Poppy, and uh, and out behind the house, behind his house, there's a row of apple trees, trunks painted white, and behind that were a couple of acres of of the the the, the family garden, right? And they'd plow it under uh, after in the winter, and it would sit, and then in the springtime, it's time just to go run the furrows in it to plant. But when I was a little boy, I would put my hands. On and he and Poppy would be behind me, uh, hands on this little iron walk behind plow. And Orsonego will tell you, I still have this plow, it's in my barn. And we would dig these little furrows. Now, for those that don't know, an acre is 43,560 square feet. Some land, Troy's a land guy, he knows, right? Now, for those who are trying to wrap your head around, what's that exactly? I got a 4,000 square foot house. Okay. 
209 feet in two, by 209 feet. If it were a square, 209 feet by 209 feet is roughly an acre, okay? If you're having trouble with that, it's a 70-yard return, okay, roughly. Okay, so there's, there's this, this uh, envision this acre back here, and I'm with Poppy plowing furrows in it. So half a furrow is about 100 feet. Now, let's dive back in the story. Jonathan David, it says, this first slaughter, the first slaughter, they killed 20 men in a half a furrow inside of an acre. Better than any video game you can imagine. Okay, these guys kicked some, you know what. Um, between these two men, remember, there was one sword and one spear. Two guys, two weapons, 20 men. Now imagine Goliath. You know, Goliath's got a shield in front of him and a javelin and a spear and a sword. So he's got air cover, air support. He's got uh, long range, medium range, and short range uh, uh, combat. Now, more than likely, these 20 guys had some equipment. It doesn't say explicitly, but they... They probably had some gear. Fair? Okay. So when you think about this, man to man, it's 10 to 1 odds. 20 men to 2 men, 10 to 1 odds. When you look at equipment or weapons, at a minimum, it's 40 to 1 odds. And it could be upwards of 60 or 70 or 80, depending on what other gear they had. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for he is not restrained to save by many or save by few. Against all odds, clearly outnumbered, size matters. The greater the size, the greater the power. It's really the power that matters. The greater the power, the greater the devastation. Do for yourself what the occasion requires, for God is with you. What if, what if God preposterously is proposing to us to be our armor bearer? You catch that? Not the other way around. That's probably a given. I want to be God's armor bearer. Whichever direction you turn, I'll go. But what if God... What if he might just be proposing? What if that he'll be our armor bearer? Do whatever the occasion requires. And here I am with you. Turn to the left, turn to the right, and my heart's with you. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. Go to your tables. You've got four questions. And I'll pull us back together in about 15. Sure you've heard this before. Credit goes to uh, G. Michael Hopf. Uh, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. History has a rhythm. It does repeat itself. It doesn't have to, but it does repeat itself. Um, and men, let's face it. We're living in hard times. Think about this. Um, we're inundated by this relentless barrage of crises. And they're not coming in serial. It's carpet bombing. It's po poly crises. <laughs> Economic crisis. Um, crazy money spending. The devaluation of the dollar. Hence inflation. Prices spiking. Wages are not necessarily 
corresponding with that. Um, there's evidence that the, the you know, uh, the U.S. dollar as a reserve, international reserve currency may be in jeopardy. That's debatable. We'll see. But uh, the petrodollar uh, situation, uh, that's daunting. There's a sovereign debt crisis around the globe. Um, there's a healthcare crisis. Supposedly more stuff coming. There's war. There's rumors of war. There's balloons floating over our country. Okay. Uh, there's a cultural crisis. Gender confusion. Okay. Drag queen shows in elementary school for crying out loud. I mean, you guys get it. We're, we're facing hard times. Um, in my opinion, I feel like we've got a government that's actually exercising a lot of tyranny, power grabs against its own people. That seems to be happening around the planet. We could debate this stuff, but suffice it to say, I believe we're facing hard times. Now, but God. So I'm not, in saying this, I'm not advocating uh, fear, not at all. The devil drives by fear from the rear. The Lord leads by faith from the front, leads us in faith. Um, so I'm not, I'm not advocating fear. I'm not underscoring fear. Yet I am saying, let's be sober. So if this is the occasion that is in front of us, what does the occasion require of us? Now, that's obviously between each of us and the Lord. And sometimes I wonder, I don't know if any of you are like, like this or not. I'll, and I wonder sometimes, you know, what's God have for me? I'm 60 years old. Am I, this might sound silly to you, but, you know, am I a William Wallace of my time? <laughs> Outside looking in, I don't see any signs of that. I'm Joe. But sometimes I wonder. Um, most of us live an ordinary life, an obscure life. Um, in, in a sense, at least as far as the world stage is concerned, I can speak for myself. I don't know about you. I'm kind of a nobody. I'm a, I'm a son of the king, no question. But you know what I mean. And more often than not, God seems to choose the nobodies and then the nobodies become somebodies and when God is searching for when, when there's an occasion and God is searching for a player to plug into the occasion he ain't looking at zip recruiter he ain't looking at LinkedIn you know he's not looking at monster he's not he's not uh, engaging corn fairy <laughs> okay he searches to and fro for a man who has a heart after his own heart. He looks for these Jonathans. He looks for the Davids. He looks for those like the armor bearer that say, Lord, turn to the left. Here I am. Whatever you want me to do. And these people that he picked, these nobodies like David, you know, there's a, there's a, a whole period of time where they're, they're waiting. And when they're waiting, they don't even know what they're waiting for. But in the waiting is preparing. They're preparing. God's preparing them in the waiting. And where are they waiting? In an ordinary, obscure life. Much of the time. Psalm 144. It's an exquisite psalm. I would encourage you guys to go, go hang out there. And it's apropos for our times. And in it, and I'll wrap this up. In it, David says, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. So in the waiting, as we're waiting, as we're waiting, what do we do? Well, I'd say two things. Believe the next right thing and do the next right thing. Believe the next right thing. We act out of our beliefs. We've talked about that before. Believe the next right thing. 
Well, like what? Size matters. You know, when, when, when uh, David stood before Goliath, they called, the Philistines called Goliath, Goliath their dread champion. Now, what the Philistines did not see was behind David was his dread champion, the Almighty God. They saw the results of size. Size matters. Power matters. God plus one man equals the majority. God wins. Believe the next right thing. Do the next right thing. What does the occasion require? Um, do what the occasion requires. Only do not disobey God. Faith equals risk. And I do believe God is inviting us, man. He's inviting us to place a demand on him and his resources. We've talked about this before, and it, it's worth repeating. Bear, it bears uh, repeating, and that is he's a good father. We're made in his image, and think about fathers. Sometimes it's difficult for us to think of a good father because of our experience with our father. I get it. I like to build things, Troy can tell you. I like to build things, and I built a little woodshed. And before it started, I had a pile of crusher run out there. And I bought a little wheelbarrow and a little shovel and a little rake for my grandson. Okay. And he thinks he built a woodshed. It's what good fathers do. And we serve a good father. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. We know that. Okay. But as we're waiting... As we live in the obscure, as we live in the ordinary, he may be preparing us. And occasions are ordinary and occasions are extraordinary. But as we're waiting, he trains our fingers for war. Come, let us go to the other side. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For he is not restrained to save by many or save by few. Let's pray. Good father. <laughs> Thank you for being a good father. Thank you for inviting us to do what the situation requires, depending upon, relying upon you for your strength and your power. Help us to believe, truly believe in our hearts that one man plus you is the majority. Give us wisdom to see what you want us to see. And I pray to a man in here and a man joining by video, to a person that you create in us hearts like David, hearts like Jonathan, hearts that are after your heart. But whatever you have for us in our remaining years, Lord, um, may you, may you receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Get out of here.